of uh, travel through history, hence the kind of phone booth, Bill and Ted, excellent adventure type throwback here. But essentially, begins with an 84-year-old male who presented with an episode of dysarthria and lightheadedness, um, was eventually, we were eventually consulted for an evaluation because there was something off about him uh, where they thought maybe something vascular was going on based on his risk factors of hypertension, coronary artery disease. He had prior um, cerebellar strokes on a CT of his head, uh, which led to us getting involved. Um, there is vitals, nothing uh, too out of the ordinary, not even super hypertensive at all. Um, going to his relevant exam, I've kind of highlighted some stuff as well as put in the and I stroke scale on the right um, that was performed during the consult, but the stuff in the kind of Celtics green color um, is what's important. So he notably had a right lateral gaze palsy, a left-sided nasal labial fold flattening, so an upper motor neuron facial droop on the left, and then left-sided weakness. Um, also had some mild dysarthria, notably in the setting of his prior cerebellar infarcts did have some residual left-sided dysmetria on finger to nose for which he scored for on the NIH stroke scale but the main new findings are kind of the dysarthria but this combination of full bar symptoms and left-sided weakness he ended up getting an MRI I'll note that his CT EA did have some posterior circulation atherosclerosis throughout the vertebral system. Um, but on the left, you see a diffusion weighted image um, with the corresponding uh, ADC image on the right. And you see uh, hyper intensity or, or true restricted diffusion there um, in the right kind of medial pons. And what this combination of symptoms really is, is what's called Raymond syndrome or Raymond syndrome. Um, it was first described by a French neurologist, Fulgence Raymond, in 1896 in a young woman with syphilis. I um, believe what he had noted was a left uh, six-nerve palsy, a right-sided upper motor neuron facial droop, and right-sided weakness. And what he postulated was that this was going to be a lesion in the pons around, and we'll talk about this, um, around where the corticofacial fibers would have to decussate uh, to innervate the contralateral facial nucleus. Um, what's interesting kind of about this case as a side note is the patient later developed aphasia, like an encephalopathy and other cortical findings. Um, so the patient that he described probably didn't actually have um, this lesion um, as she progressed with her syphilis. Um, so again, the, the triad would be an ipsilateral abducens, a contralateral upper motor neuron facial palsy, and contralateral weakness. And why this happens, kind of looking at the anatomy, I stole this from a, a case report, um, because this is a, a really rare entity where you have to hit a really specific area. As we know, the, the six nerve nucleus kind of looking on the, the axial cut um, which is in the green, the facial nerve kind of wraps dorsally around that, the facial colliculus, and then they both go out eventually. Um, to be able to cause a lesion like this, you have to hit just where these corticofacial fibers are decussating around that facial nucleus ipsilaterally without actually impacting that ipsilateral facial nerve. Um, while also getting the, the corticospinal fibers and the sixth nerve as it's exiting the brainstem. So it's a really rare vascular lesion to do this because if you get slightly more laterally um, and hit the facial nerve itself, you're more likely to cause what's called Miller-Gubler syndrome, which has the ipsilateral uh, lower motor neuron facial palsy and sixth with contralateral hemiparesis. More commonly, you may get too lateral and get more sensory findings, which is Gasparini syndrome. Um, or too dorsally, which is facial colliculus syndrome. There's a lot of these like uh, pontine syndromes that are quite interesting that a lot of older neurologists have described. Um, but this one is, is super rare to be caused by a stroke and, and rarely seen. There's only few case reports on it. Um, for our patient, um, he was actually discharged on dual antiplatelet because he was already supposed to be on that long term for his chronic peripheral arterial disease, as well as his coronary artery disease. LDL was 118. Uh, he was continued on a, a statin. Uh, he was diabetic uh, with an A1C of 6.8. He was sent out with a loop, though the etiology was thought to be small vessel disease, which is most common in these regions because he had some left atrial enlargement on his echocardiogram um, and was sent to be followed up. There are my references. 
and I appreciate your time. All right, uh, thank you. Great case. I remember when I used to care about syndromes like that. Um, so to introduce today's grand round speaker is Wayne Feng. Okay. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome to the and a neurology grand run today. Uh, today is actually uh, a grand run by three departments, neurology, neurosurgery, and anesthesiology. Uh, we have a great speaker today, Dr. John John from uh, Loma Linda University. Last night, I was looking at his CV, trying to prepare the introduction this morning. I kept asking myself, how can one person accomplish so many things? So here are the numbers, okay? Why we all struggle is get a one out of one. He has a 14 out of one and one PPG. Why we struggle with writing paper, he publishes 728 manuscripts so far. H index 81. Uh, if you have H-Index 1920, you probably qualify for a social professor. He is in H-Index 81. Total citation 27,000 and, uh, and 256. He gave over four, 400 presentations. He edited a 25 stroke and CNS disorder books, which I had an opportunity to work with him, just only edited one book. And um, he's the editor chief for three major Stroke uh, Medical Journal, and uh, one we probably all know is the translation of stroke research with impact factor now about a nine. Also the editor chief for the brain hemorrhage, also editor in chief for the, uh, for the uh, medical gas uh, journal. And um, 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 so it's an incredible accomplishment and John achieved over the years. He really con uh, introduced uh, you know, new concept for early brain injury and after subarachnoid hemorrhage, now accepted by, you know, the clinical practice really began to change the, um, in, in the patient outcome. And, uh, and uh, he also uh, introduced a new concept uh, called a vascular and a neural network. Uh, this was published in Natural Review of Neurology in 2012, really emphasized the arterial venous network in the pathophysiology of a stroke. Uh, so his work is really um, in a, in a, uh, challenges the, you know, and the current treatment paradigm. And today, his talks are really uh, going to talk about uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and open opening vessel in a cr chronic occluding patient really is also a uh, challenge and current treatment paradigm. With this, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Uh, John Zhang. So it's not muted, right? <laughs> I see someone is not my face, it's someone else. Oh, oh, oh someone uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Right. I'm still in PowerPoint. Give me one second. I see you now. <laughs> Yeah, give me one second. Let's see if your slides go. All right, I hope. Uh, All right, we, we hear you. It's good. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's working. You, you, you said uh, this is going to be a Zoom only meeting. I didn't know what that means. Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fung, for the invitation. My first time in Duke. 
Yeah, uh, compare with the Los Angeles, you have a lot of trees <laughs> <laughs> and mosquitoes too. <laughs> a lovely place. I used to be in the in the deep south in Jackson, Mississippi, in Louisiana. So it's all like back home. The, the, everything seems like uh, many years ago. So I'm going to talk about something called a delayed recanalization, which I, I, I mean, there's no time restriction. It's not six hours delay, not 24. It can be endless. Why delay? You can see the left corner, we have American Heart Association guy, and I think still true, right? Four and a half hours TPA, six hours from back to me, even though we're pushing envelope to 16, even 24 hours for a small minority group patients. The majority of patients still come to the hospital either on the last call or their treatment will be delayed. Uh, I listed an article a few months ago in Lancet by a Chinese group. They summarized uh, 1,724 good hospitals. They all have stroke center. It's not just general hospital. And their TPA is 5.6%. So back to me is 1.5%. So if you, let's say 7% total, if half patient improved, we've helped 3% of patients in the country. So that's why we have to think about, can we do something after this so-called therapeutic window? The second part, <coughs> excuse me, I try to get into the mechanisms. So there are going to be hundreds of mechanisms, right? When you have the blood vessel reopened, everything goes in, good, bad, and the worst. So one thing I want to focus today is kind of peripheral brain connection or rather say interaction. I think if we reestablish this interaction, we have a chance to rejuvenate the brain. So I want to use a word, maybe a layman word, rejuvenate, because I don't know what's going on when you reopen the vessel, why patients get better. So I, I will, uh, I hope it works. It doesn't work, huh? No, it does not. Oh, okay, now, now, it's, now it's working, okay. okay. Thank you. I will talk three things. First, clinical observations of delayed recanalization for stroke treatment. I want to emphasize this is not prevention. I see Henry Burnett many years ago did a clinical trial, say, okay, we are going to reopen the vessel to prevent the next the stroke. I think that's totally misleading the world that we, we don't do that anymore. But I want to say, you can correct me, this is not prevention we're going to make a difference by doing delayed recanalization. Second part is mechanistic hypothesis. I want to emphasize one thing, the wholeness. When you have a major vessel occluded, you are not whole anymore. You have one region of the brain need blood supply. So when we reopen the vessel, we make men whole. So that's the second. Why I say that? Because I'm from La Malinda. La Malinda's logo is to make men whole. Yeah, so I, I make my dean happy when I say that. <laughs> yeah. The third part is we're using lab experiments, try to explain the clinical observation. So we call it from bedside back to bench approach. Firstly, clinical observation, I call it saving private Ryan. It's high risk, maybe for some people. Yeah, it's high risk because bleeding, brain swelling. And I say it's extremely physician dependent. Some people just can't do it. Some people do this every single day, like piece of cake. I have friends doing 150 cases a year for delayed recanola, not for the acute. They wait one month, two months, three months, two years. They reopen the vessel. They do that 150 cases a year. Never had any trouble. So I still want to say this is only for the briefs. You have to be have a brain, you have to have a heart too, and you have to have good hands. This is one case, uh, my friend said, he is a, 
a small guy in a small hospital. I, I went to his hospital. He invited me many times. I said, no, I'm not going unless you have a case ready so I can see. So he said, okay, we got so many cases. This is a, a gigantic brain infarction after one month, right? Medical treatment didn't do anything. So family members demanding, this is not in the guideline, right? After a month. So they don't have this consent form or anything in China because family members just begging, they even kneel down and say, please do it for my father, reopen his vessel because my whole family going down. No one can go to work anymore. So he reopened the vessel. You can see the right side, the, the limb weakness zero or five, basically nothing, right? Aphasia, slow responding to instructions. After reopening the immediately, patient can left the right leg. So the, 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 the muscle strength recovered to four or five. And, and second day, even the upper limb changed. Yeah, here is another one that my friend sent it to me. You see the rest of the middle severity occlusion. He did a stand, hold the vessel. I, I, unfortunately, I, it's not on my computer, so I don't have the video. You can see the same thing, 57 years old, one month after the stroke. Again, medical treatment didn't do anything. You know, family members demanding recanalization. On the third day after surgery, patient basically totally recovered. Yeah, I have the video down there, but I can't show you today because it's not, not my computer. So we have four major vessels, right? I'm C, I, C, A, B, A, and V, A. So let's see. I've been talking about this for almost 10 years. I, I said one thing, I've, I've been in China maybe a hundred times. I said, just show me ranking scores. Physicians show me how long the thrombosis take out, how the vessel looks beautiful after it can I said, no, just show me ranking scores. So I pushed for three years, they began to publish. This guy, he did, he probably did it 15 years ago. He doesn't do this anymore. He said, this is just so simple. He gave it to his junior fellows to do that. He did hundreds of cases of this delayed recanalization. So I said, okay, show me your ranking score. Finally, he, he managed to find 65 people, patients. He can actually do the follow-ups. In China, normally they do surgery and then bye-bye. They don't see patients anymore. You, you are healed, right? Why, why you need to come back to see me? So now they, I'm forcing them to do the follow-ups. But you can see the patient 17 to 120 days after stroke. Uh, some, some are kind of long. The, the ranking score improved from 3.4 to 2.5. Not great, yeah, but I, I, I think it's much better. But you can see some patient is 120 days, so almost three months is still improved. So I talked to him, he said, yeah, the first the one to three months, that's the easiest time. So you can reopen the vessel anytime. It's a piece of cake for them. It's not even a real surgery. So he doesn't do that anymore. But after six months, the, the, the thrombus kind of febrilized. It's, it's like white color. So it, it takes some skills to take it down. But anyway, as I see, this is, this is a young guy. He's a neurologist, but he does this. Uh, he did this more than 100 cases a year just for delayed recanalization. So and he's quick. He did this uh, middle cerebral artery sees 14 to 20, uh, 29 days after stroke. And very quickly, I think 85.7% uh, of patient, the ranking score improved to two or below two. So that's a, a great thing. And he also did the basilar artery, as you can see 15 days after occlusion and 75% of patient achieving good score means the ranking score below two. And here he did vertebral, uh, same thing. And David Hassan from here, he, he actually summarized almost 400 cases. And yeah, I think I read his article because those cases, the same, no one follow up on patients. So he cannot really make a conclusion say, okay, how many patients improved? M most of those case report, but he find that uh, reverse uh, hypertension improved cognition. That's uh, mostly uh, patients will tell you. So the question is, after achieving all this, are we doing a prevention or we're doing a treatment? So you can 
think about and tell me. So I told everyone in China, I said, okay, I don't want to hear your story, how successful you are. Tell me what the patient, after surgery, patient wake up, what they say, the first thing they say to you. From patient's point, it's not measured by ranking score, right? So patient personal feelings, what they feel different. So at least see that. The, this is direct translation from Chinese. I, I hope it is English. I feel much more light in my vision. That's uh, the, for many patients that the world changed. I can see so much better. Maybe internal karate, maybe posterior circulation improved. And even sometimes the, the, the motor function didn't change that much, but patient will tell they feel much stronger. They feel energetic. I don't know if it's mental or it's physical. And most the patient will tell you the first thing, my head clear. I never had troubles like strokes. I don't know what that means. But for patients, that's a huge thing. On the OR table, when they wake up from my next seat, the first thing, oh my God, my head cleared. So we all say, I said, okay, you get from the publishing New England Journal of Medicine, find out what my head clear means and, and write the paper, right? <laughs> What you mean, I, I have much brighter light in my vision. Find out how to measure that and then you will publish, right? And I don't have headache or dizziness and this is easy. But the last one, almost every patient says this to you, especially after a few months after stroke. I'm a new person. I feel reborn again. I ask everybody, I want to read. So, so much difference. For physicians, we are still looking at the ranking scores, sensory, motor. For patients, that's important, but they have so many other things important. We don't know how to measure. So patients feel, the whole family feel patient improved, but for physicians, no, I didn't see anything. So that's, again, from mental to physical. As a physician, I, I, I think in the old time, neurologists basically see psychiatric patients. So, so they, people actually evaluating the mental side more. So I ask family members what they feel. Family members says, patient changed. It's a different person. A personality change. I, I remember, remember Phineas Gage, right? The guy in the real way got a, a rod into his frontal lobe and his personality changed. And this patient after stroke, six months, one year, and then you reopen the vessel, the family member said, he changed or she changed. So I said, give me an example. They said, yeah, the two o'clock in the morning, I got to wake up, my patient said, I want to eat this and that. After surgery, patient doesn't do that anymore. So I said, wow, how to measure that? <laughs> I can't. But anyway, there are a lot of things happened and we just need to find a new evaluation methodology. So I think that will be challenging. So second is, what is the mechanism? Why after a year, two years, six months, two months, you reopen the vessel, patients changed. So what's the mechanism? So it's, for me, this you cannot say we're saving penumbra anymore, right? Penumbra is supposed to die in six hours. Right? That's how we do thrombectomy. We put six hours initially because penumbra died in six hours. Why bother to reopen the vessel? That's why we say we reopen the vessel as a prevention, not as a treatment. But after two years, you do that. I think that the Robert Spatzler from, uh, from uh, Arizona, he did a case in the 70s. He published a, a stroke patient 16 years after he did a bypass patient, actually the function improved. So he published a paper at that time really challenging this uh, so-called penumbra hypothesis. So for me, penumbra only work 24 hours. After 24 hours, forget about penumbra. It does not exist. That's nonsense, okay? So what's the mechanism? If, if it's not a saving private right, so what we are saving? <laughs> so I call it rejuvenation because I don't know. But patient getting better, something must be happening, right? At least it's some people here, uh, they did something similar. You can see brain is not an island. So you cannot cut the head off and then still talking to the patient, the patient is over. So 
the brain has to be connected to the rest of the body with all the other organs. So I use in Abraham Lincoln's word, of people, by the people, for the people, of the other organs, by the other organs, and for the other organs. Again, if we can recanalize, it doesn't matter how long after stroke, we make men whole and people will change. So there's an article I found this peripheral to central. So they listed after stroke brain and spleen function and heart, kidney, liver, pancreas, and GI. So you can see the little picture here, the, the cerebral circulation uh, has to be connected through peripheral and they influence each, each other. In this article, they are emphasizing the bad thing. After stroke, the pancreas will send more bad things to the brain and kill your neural cells. Yeah. There are good things too, right? So let me show you some of the good things from the liver. I think Patty Hearn, uh, Penny Packer did the spleen. Uh, I already call out his nature paper looking at the, the microbiome and, and stroke, right? That's a, a breakthrough. But we have been looking at multiple things, especially the liver. What's from the liver after stroke will help. And that sometimes play a huge role. So we go back to the lab and try to see, can we using animal models to explain the clinical observations? So we're targeting this gigantic stroke, major vessel occlusions. By Amanda Fisher's many years uh, calculation in this type of stroke, 20% patient die, 50% disabled. So we try to mimic this very deadly problem. So we use something called a permanent occlusion. We occlude middle cerebral artery for 30 days. And 30% animal will die. For patient it's 20%, but you have ICU, right? You try to save patients. That's why your mortality is 20%. If you don't do anything, I think more than 20% of patients will die. So we have a 30% rats will die because we don't have ICU for rats. And the, the remaining 70%, we call them strong rats. You know, they didn't die with a, a suture in the middle cerebral artery for a whole month. They survived. I'm just have this presumption. They might have some collateral circulation. That's why they don't, they don't have malignant brain edema to kill them. So anyway, this is uh, the model we use and we publish a few papers, very hard to publish because every time we submit the paper, we got the reviewers comment back there, why you reopen the vessel after one week? Why not open it after one hour? I sometimes puzzle, so are you guys really getting dumb after getting a PhD? We, our purpose is to delay reopening the body because patients cannot come to the hospital in one hour. But we got rejection and rejection. Those people say, why you not re reopen the body in one hour? But anyway, we managed to publish some. So I'm going to give you some examples for the, the red color, the liver factor in the brain. We didn't get this idea by ourselves, we borrowed it. There was an article in PLUS One in 2013 called the Trifoid Factor Three, which is from the liver. We call it F, a TFF3. The guy found something similar five days after stroke, this liver factor increase, right? If you manipulate, you take it out, the animal gets worse. If you put it back, animal getting better. I can say this guy probably have the same trouble to publish because after five days, what are you saving? Penumbra already died four days ago, right? So he has to publish in plus one. But we feel like this is a great idea. So we draw this, see from the liver, TFF3 released into serum, especially after stroke. There's a signal, I don't know what signals, after cerebral ischemia, something, trigger, the liver began to produce and release TFF3. But this guy cannot pass in through blood brain barrier. So if you measure the brain or nothing. So you have to do something called delayed recanalization, right? Or bypass. So 
TFF3 from liver come to serum, from serum will go to brain, and then we will bind with something called the lingo 2, and then releasing EGFR, and then increasing all the good guys, the SARC, BCL2, there are good guys, and reducing the bad guys, CASP3 and cell deaths. I said, okay, let's do that and see if we can find a good reason for delayed recanalization. So the first one we're going to do, looking at the TFF3 expression after delayed recanalization. You see, this is the liver. Interestingly, after stroke, TFF3 in liver began to increase. There are nothing before stroke. So something triggered, the liver will respond. And regardless we reopen the vessel or not, in the liver, the level increase because it doesn't, it doesn't be affected by recanalization. It's just affected by stroke. So you see day three, day four, day six, the level increase very high. You can see the bar below. And the, the last one on the right side, you can see serum level also steadily increase for day six, even day 10. So this is a delayed response. After stroke, a few days later, liver began to release TFF3. If you don't do delayed recanalization, those guys will do nothing. They will circulate in the body and with time disappear. Patient will not benefit. So how about the brain? You can see here. In the brain, if we don't open the vessel, it's called a PMCAO, permanent occlusion or R means recanalization, right? You can see only in the recanalization group, day four, day six, even day 10, TFF3 level increase, the top one, right? So on the right side, you can see TFF3 increase several times higher than the one without delayed recanalization. So you have good guys coming out of the liver, stay in the blood. But if you don't reopen the vessel, it's all wasted, right? Just have you have money in the bank, but you cannot withdraw cash. That means you don't have anything. And the good guy on the lower end is the phosphor related because the PEGFR also increased, same as TFF3, right? And let me... It's just so most of the TFF3 actually express in neurons. After recanalization, TFF3 from liver to the blood, from blood actually enter the brain and they express mostly in the neurons. So they're gonna be neural protective. You can see the lower end on the top. If we don't open the vessel, it's a PMCO means permanent, right? You see a little bit green color, that's the TFF3. But lower end RMCO means we, we open the vessel after three days. We make a stroke, we leave the suture in the middle cerebral for three days and we pull it out to mimicking a delayed recanalization. And then we wait another three days, it's day six. You can see a huge infiltration of the green color to the penumbra region, if we still call it penumbra after six days. So there's a huge expression of TFF3 around the infarction, and they're going to do all the good things. So let's look at the short term evaluation. Right? After six days, you can see the brain infarction decreased by 30%. Again, we occlude the vessel. And then in one group, we do not reopen the vessel. After six days, we see an infarction, right? Another group, we occlude the vessel. We wait three days, we reopen the vessel. And wait another three days. And then we look at brain infarction. By penumbra hypothesis, nothing should happen. But you already had a stroke for three days. And then if you reopen the vessel, nothing should happen, but you can see we're reducing 30% of the infarction. That means after a stroke, the brain injury and brain recovery goes on at the same time. If you do the right intervention, you might help a patient. If you do nothing, send a patient to rehab, you probably 
miss the golden opportunities. So this is a three day. And then we look very carefully. It's something similar to the current hypothesis like infraction, penumbra, oligemia. But in the 70s, people call it the central zone, reactive zone, and marginal zone. So this is very complicated. Period. Let me just show you on the right hand side. The central zone decreased after we reopened the vessel, it means the infraction getting smaller. Right. And then the last thing on the, on the right hand side on the top <coughs> is, uh, is the one without recandalization. It's the six days after stroke, you can see some red color. This is the microglia infiltration, but lower half is we, re re we wait three days and then we reopen the vessel. And then after another three days, six days, you can see massive infiltration of microglia. Microglia does a lot, a lot of things, many, many good things and some bad things too. But we love to see microglia infiltration to the penumbra region, because that's going to reduce an infarction and improve function. <coughs> this is uh, only the, you can see that the cell death decreased. Again, three days of stroke, we reopen the vessel. By six days, we measure the cell death. We find the cell death decreased. That means there's an ongoing cell death after stroke. And we are only thinking about six hours, to four, four and a half, four and, four and a, four point five hours. But if, if you reopen the vessel after three days, you can make a huge difference. This is, uh, again, tunnel standing is the same thing. So three days in this paper, we actually did a three days delay, seven days delay, 14 days delay. Even 14 days, we reopen the vessel. We still see improvement. <clears throat> this is the function. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to, to waste your know, time to explain what I mean. The beam walking is just a motor sensory balance uh, functions. Uh, all improved three days after delayed recanalization. So how about the long term? We wait one month. For us, it's very hard to do three months or nine months. Animal getting big, right? So it's, uh, it's so expensive to keep them. So we sacrifice all of them by like one month. But you can see by one month, it's even more interesting. On the on the left lower hand, you can see if we reopen the vessel after three days, and we look at after six days, we're reducing about 25 to 30% infraction. But if we look at that after 30 days, we're reducing 50% infraction. Again, that means the injury is ongoing even after one month. If you don't reopen the vessel, patient just getting worse sometimes, unless you belong to that 30% uh, category, you get better. So let's see, this is the cell counting again in hippocampus. We see the cell death number decreased. And this is water maze for cognitive memory functions uh, improved, the rotor rod for motor balance sensory functions all improved by reopening the vessel. Again, we didn't do anything. We just reopened the vessel. Let the TFF3 from liver get to the blood and then get to the brain. If you don't open, reopen the vessel, they stay in, in the blood. And after 10 days, they're gone. So if we reopen the vessel, they go into the brain. They make such a huge difference. So is this really TFF3? So we did say, okay, we know this cannot pass in BBB, right? So we have to do delayed recanalize. Now we switch strategy. We give this uh, recombinate TFF3. It's available. We do it the nose drop. So from nose, it go to the brain without, uh, it go directly bypass the BBB, right? This is the best way to give drugs to patients. Go to the nose. It will go to the frontal lobe and then circulate back. And in this case, we did not reopen the vessel. So we basically repeat the same study three days. We did not reopen the vessel, but we gave TFF3 by nose, bypassing BBB. And we see the same thing. See, in the brain, TFF3 level increased when you give this recombinant TFF3 by nose. Right? 
And then the cell death decreased. You can see the tunnel standing on the left side. That's uh, about 30% reduction, just by nose drop of TFF3 without reopening the vessel. And the function also improved. Again, I'm not going to explain this. And then we did another thing. So can we cut the liver? Not totally cut out, animal will die. We cut 60%. So the production of TFF3 will be reduced by at least 50%, right? You cut, we cut the liver. And then we gave this TFF3 by nose to compensate. This is just a plain mechanism. Just want to show, yeah, this is from the liver, number one. Number two, this TFF3 is neuroprotective. So we did this, you can see, when we do liver resection, the level of TFF3 decrease. You can see that on the left side, the serum level decrease. In the brain level, it's also decreased. The pH means the, the liver resection. And then the last one, we add TFF3 recombinant by nose, it will come back and then produce neural protection. You see the same thing, the tunnel means cell death level decreased again. And I'm going to skip this because we have a lot of mechanisms that satisfy reviewers interest so we can publish a paper. For clinicians, this is really not important. We just try to lay out who is the top, who is in the middle, who is the next one, who is in the bottom. If you don't do that, reviewer will say, nah, you cannot publish a paper. So we did all this a lot, but uh, it, it just tell you one thing. TFF3 from the liver increase after stroke release to the serum. If we don't reopen the vessel, they are wasted. If we reopen the vessel, they go to the brain and then make a huge difference. So again, we used uh, totally 270 rats for this one study. You can see the mortality is uh, 26, 28%. So similar to patients in this uh, gigantic uh, infarction. And suggestions from my students, TFF3 increase in liver in brain after recanalization. Otherwise it doesn't go to the brain because it, it cannot pass in through blood brain barrier. Uh, three days delayed recanalization reduced the infarction, improved the neurological functions. If we do an intranasal recombinant TFF3, it's mimicked the delayed recanalization. If we do partial hepatectomy, it's reducing the effects of uh, delayed recanalization. But if we add it back from the nose, it regained the function. So tell us that once there's a continued brain injury and recovery after stroke. So that's why delayed recanalization makes sense. And that's uh, here. <laughs> here is the real hypothesis. For acute stroke, right? We are trying to expand the therapeutic window beyond six hours, maybe 16, maybe 24. But for chronic stroke, the hypothesis is let's forget about the therapeutic window. There's no such a thing called a therapeutic window. That's just for public, not for scientists. Right? You can reopen the vessel anytime, days, weeks, months, years, you make a difference. So I call the first one catching the leaving train. Patient is passing the therapeutic window. You try to expand it a little bit to catching maybe another 1% of patients. On the right-hand side for chronic stroke, I call it catching the next train. If patient missing the therapeutic window, that's fine. Uh, many of my friends, when they heard about this, said, okay, go home. After one month, come back. I'm going to reopen the vessel for you. Yeah, because this is very easy to reopen in one month. And most of patients actually benefit and improve. So here is the real take home message. Uh, current concept on the rest of this is my challenging concept, right? Time is boring. Uh, as scientists, no, time is not boring. Time is boring is fully, again, public, not for scientists. Blood flow or tissue reaction is the brain, right? Every patient behave differently. How come time is boring? 
Second, the penumbra die within six hours or maximum 24 hours after a stroke. And the challenging concept is uh, microflow injuring after a stroke and brain injury and survival continues. Or I don't know, over, for us, at least over one month, maybe even longer, maybe a year. Again, for most the stroke patients, the therapeutic window means game is over. Right? You come to the hospital after one day, your game is over. For many chronic stroke patients, there's no therapeutic window. That means the game goes on. Right? The last one, delayed recanalization is for prevention of the next stroke. This is the current concept. The challenging concept, delayed recanalization is for treatment, not prevention of chronic stroke. So I convinced the law of neurosurgery team where they began to do the first uh, trial, maybe a pilot trial. Uh, one month after middle cerebral artery occlusion, we're going to reopen the vessel and see what's going on. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you, guys. Question for you. Mm -hmm. Hold on, Jay. I just want to let me just make a. So, if uh, anybody has a question, just put your name or the question in the chat and we'll call on you. So, the first person is Danny Laskowitz. So, we also have a strong interest in translational stroke research. And uh, first of all, I want to congratulate and applaud you on, on challenging the conventional wisdom because I'm sure you suffer the bows and arrows of reviewers and but that's how progress is made so first of all thank you for challenging the conventional wisdom we've done a series of studies both early human studies and preclinical studies in delayed stroke and both of them seem to affect angiogenesis but neither of them are direct neither of them are direct channel for example was in humans, humans, we just ran a clinical, just ran a clinical study, study where we very tactically injected stem cells uh, 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 tumor differentiated or epithelial cell, cell line these are patients six months to 18 months out it's not expected that these cells engraft, and there's no clear evidence of plasticity, but one of the things it seems to do is to promote angiogenesis. Mm -hmm. So we took it a step back in a preclinical model. This is uh, not permanent. This is ischemia reperfusion, MCAO, right. and we gave a recombinant GDF-11, and one of the track uh, factors that we mm -hmm. think is released after stroke, we give it subacutely, and the animals get better. And again, it's not clear to me why. It seems the, the, the biggest, biggest thing we can find mechanistically is that it promotes angiogenesis. So my question to you is, do you think there are medical options, either by stem cell, herbalant stem cells, or by identifying pertinent trophic factors that can be given subacutely, even in the absence of mechanical reopening of a vessel that might promote angiogenesis and, and, and improve recovery? I, I totally agree. Uh, we actually had some data, too, in the back. Let me see. Yeah, it's the same delayed recanalization. It's uh, improved angiogenesis uh, and everything. So as we tried the, the, the intranasal approach, even without, uh, if we know this thing will do angiogenesis, we can bypass the BBD. Yeah, it will function. But uh, for me, even its function, it, it's at a very low level. Because without the proper blood flow, most good things will not do too much. I mean, the overall environment is important. Yeah, there's one guy who wants to do a lot of good things, but the overall in environment is against that. They can. So for me, still, even we do stem cells, I, I agree. If we recanalize and then we do stem cells, we may have a much better chance by dropping stem cells so the animal alone, there's no blood flow, and let them try to survive. They became they became scar tissues mostly. If we reopen the vessel, and then we add stem cells, we might see totally different response. If reopen vessel is so easy, why why not we do it right? So you might argue that if we did a permanent MCA occlusion model, we would mm -hmm. we would not see the benefit. We're seeing benefit you you either. might you might see but some not as much as the no not model yeah this is like a huge. Yeah, clinically, patients suddenly they can move, they can do everything. I, I know Gary Steinberg, right? He did yeah, stem cells. Yeah. yeah, but that's effects compared with delayed recanalization, there's almost nothing. Yeah. I have a question. So, uh, 
when I was a young person, they were doing the EC IC bypass studies uh, and found no benefit to that. Now, they were probably looking at stroke occurrence, but where does that fit in your thinking? Yeah, I know that uh, pretty while. I, maybe, maybe Dr. Feng, though, I wrote a stroke history book, probably the only one in the world. Do you I, want for the young folks, can you explain what the ECIC was? Uh, oh, it's just the bypass, right? They would bypass <laughs> a, the middle meningeal artery because yeah. they were doing cardiac bypasses. And they'd stick that onto the CA or something. They'd stick yeah. it onto something. Yeah, it's uh, it's invented by a Turkish guy. So that's make American neurosurgeon really humiliating because the <laughs> Turkish guy, the young guy, in Turkey, may, most of the graduates from medical school, they tend to go to European or North America to do something and then they go back. So it's very hard for them to find a good job because they are very competitive in Turkey. Their level as a professor is higher than most of the countries. So I have many Turkish students. So I know the guy from Turkey, he graduated, he went to uh, New York. He went to a lab, uh, I think in Vermont, Vermont a lab. And the guy was doing easy bypass and it all failed. So he did it, he failed too. Yeah, at, that, at that time, they're, they're transferred veins of arteries to, to the brain. So, and then he was thinking, maybe we flip around and making this temporal, what's the name of that, I forgot go directly, go to middle cerebral artery branch. So it's just a, a local surgery. And then he actually succeeded in, in some dogs. At that time, those papers can never publish these days. These days, uh, reviewers like, they are so mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> he did a couple of dogs. He found the blood vessel actually still patent. And then he didn't even publish, but he published in a book chapter. So that, that's the first paper for EC, IC bypass. It will achieve similar level, but you have more complications because of the surgery. And then it's a very small branch. So sometimes blood flow, sometimes it will work perfect. Sometimes it does not. And clinical trial failed. I think one of the reasons is the surgeon. Uh, someone did a, a a backward look at, at the whole thing. Most of them did only two cases. So, so they don't even know how to do that. They actually joined the trial. So many trial published data, eventually we find this all failed data. I, I can't say falsified, but they didn't falsify. But the it's, surgery is extremely physician dependent or surgeon dependent. For some surgery, if you do 100 cases, you are pretty good. If you do 2,000 cases, you are superb. If you only do two cases in your life and then you begin to join the clinical trial, you ruin the clinical trial. So, so I, I have to interrupt So, here. Dr. Powers, you've had questions? Since, since I did these trials. I try, to, I try not to say anything like that no, here. I, I did these trials. <laughs> I know he, I guess. <laughs> and, and the idea that- You're supposed to be so, in yes, Washington, right? So, yes, in the trial, <laughs> surgeons, <laughs> surgeons might have only done two studies. The ECIs? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's why I try not to say that. <laughs> Bill, you, my opinion. you might have to unmute. We don't hear anything. Uh, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Bill. It's our fault. I, I, I am oh, unmuted. Now we hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. So I did these trials, the ECIC trials, and I'd like to make a comment. First of all, what you said is inaccurate. Uh -oh. That yes, within the trials, surgeons did two to four cases, but the surgeons who were in the trials had done dozens, if not a hundred cases in addition to and before. So that idea that they were inexperienced surgeons is actually not true. They were the most experienced surgeons around. But the main thing I'd like to point out is we actually looked at modified rankings in these trials with delayed recanalization by ECIC bypass. And we documented that the bypass actually did improve blood flow. Did. And there was absolutely no difference in a randomized controlled trial in the modified Rankin scores at follow-up. And these people were bypassed about two to three months after their strokes. So that 
not quite the same thing as opening up the vessel in the neck, but certainly improving perfusion, and it did not affect the degree of recovery from the stroke. And those were randomized studies. May I make a comment myself? This is David Hassan. Can you hear me? Sure. Go right ahead. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, John, this is amazing. And I love the, you always push the envelope and chart um, uh, frontiers, you know, and we want more people like you to help a clinician think outside the box. Um, I'm, uh, as you know, I have the funding from the NIA to do opening of the chronically occluded cervical ICA. And to kind of help Rich with his terminology, it's not the middle meningeal artery, it's the STA, superficial temporal artery right. to the MCA bypass. <laughs> and I agree, and I agree with uh, Dr. Powell is um, the surgeons were all competent. There's a lot of flaws to the cost one overestimation of uh, the event in the primary and the control group, they assumed 40%, which turned out to be 20%. There's a lot of flaws to the design of the study itself. But one of the things we did <clears throat> comparison in terms of CTP fusion, when you do an SDA to MCA bypass, you're only providing a small amount to trying to supply blood to the entire hemisphere. So you're only perfusing that small region. And when you do a perfusion CTP after a successful bypass, you're only like perfusing about two to three centimeter radius. So the trick for this is to open the whole entire vessel. And that's why we're doing it with endovascular trying to open the, uh, this, the artery. Uh, one of the things I was gonna make a comment on, there's also a structural changes. So we did uh, get the MRI before and after the uh, the opening the vessels completely. Um, and we noted, we looked at all structural changes and we noted that the hippocampus, especially on the left side for the chronically occluded ICA, it changes with time. Actually, the people who had successfully recanalized their hippocampus returns to normal size. We don't know why, but we still kind of looking into it. And that's one of the observation we noted in our, it's a small study so far, we only enrolled 19 patients. We have 19 to go, trying to move the study, hopefully in the next week or two, we'll move it from Iowa to here to restart. But um, I really believe in the chronic, um, not on the level of cytokines and chemokines, but also on the terms of structure. So if this is stands that the hippocampus really changes, um, with the reperfusion, that's uh, revolutionary in itself. Uh, we don't know the mechanism, but that's going to give hope for people who have cognitive dysfunction to improve with time. Totally agree with you, David. We also see the structural changes. I hope I have. You can see some of the slides here. Uh, there's uh, a lot of changes. Uh, I really don't know why they change. Uh, but it seems after recanalization, at least in animal models, uh, a lot of change going to the good side. Uh, uh, okay, uh, two more questions. So first, then, then, then Wayne to end it. Um, so great talk. Uh, my question is brief. So you talked a lot about this TFF3 lingo to pathway. Has there been any thought about like development of a neuropeptide or drug essentially that you could give early on when you couldn't recanalize the vessel based on like risk factors and mm -hmm. like that? Yeah. Um, as, a means, um, as a means of like neuroprotection or rejuvenation before you later on might recanalize. The vessel. Yeah. Repeat his question. Uh, the question is uh, the next step, right? Should we go to clinical and using the, the peptide? Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's that's a great question. That's uh, something uh, in our mind too. Is uh, firstly we 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 find a lot of good things, and for this one should be shouldn't be an issue because this is from liver from it's natural the, the body product. So uh, we do have a uh, recombinant human studies. So should it should be pushed. <laughs> uh, in Loma Linda, a little bit harder to do that. 
yeah, because uh, we don't have a lot of uh, research physicians in Loma Linda. We have uh, some, but not many compared with big schools uh, like UCLA. They have like 120, 130 faculties. Uh, many of them have ROS. Yeah, we have a small department. Yeah, so, but definitely uh, anyone's interested uh, should uh, check with, uh, with FDA or something to see if they can be used clinically. Yeah, for me, we, we have this dream for many years, it started from snake venom. We, we find a, a portion of that is also effective. It's more like using fire against fire, the venom causing swelling, right? So can we give a little bit of venom and prevent swelling from the nose too? Yeah, we were not very successful at clinical translation. Uh, one is uh, I didn't push too hard on that. Another thing is uh, our environment uh, seems uh, deep more more difficult to do that. But I I I really love your idea to move to clinical. Maybe paramed can just begin to drop that. Doesn't matter. It's hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. But this yeah, is just the protection. All right, Wayne. Why don't you uh, bring us home? Sure. All right. Well. Thanks to John, and I really like the idea. If it misses this passing train, just waiting for the next one. And I feel there's so many patients waiting, waiting to catch the train. And so, if this this proved to be effective, really going to change your care. Um, my question to you is: In the very beginning, you showed a lot of clinical case. Uh, you also mentioned there seems there's an immediate improvement as well as a delayed improvement. And a lot of things you talk about the liver, I think probably going to be explained the delayed effect. I think the immediate improvement still, I, you know, based on my based on my clinical observation, uh, I think it's still still going to change some of the numbers, and then they actually have the immediate effect. So that's kind of question to you. Do you see any any more uh, um, observe any number changes? And you also mentioned those are very strong rats, means they probably have good collateral. Mm -hmm. Go to Panamos and those patients, those are rats. Yeah, happy, yeah. Yeah, happy rats. yeah, that's great questions. Uh, Clinical, very hard to explain. We had many argument on, on WeChat. We have uh, something like Facebook type of thing, or many people doing that. And sometimes we even think this is just a pseudo effect. Patient is mentally paralyzed. <laughs> you just read it just like a like pl pl placebo effect. But sometimes we just can't explain. After one month, you reopen the vessel. Second day, patient began to walk from totally paralyzed and, and turn to walk. So what gets saved? It really penumbra, this is already a month. Where is the penumbra? Why penumbra lives so long? So should we just say it's oligemia or it's a combination of multiple things? I, I really don't know. Yeah, so we had many debate, we cannot explain this. Yeah, so I would rather see re recanalization after a month or two patients begin to slowly recover, more like angiogenesis effects or neurogenesis. But we do help patients most of the second day, the third day, they begin to walk again. Yeah, many patients after surgery, they get carried back home. And then after one week, they walk back to see the doctor. So that's like a magic, magical thing. Yeah. So I really don't know. All right. Well, all right. That's a great way to end it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, all right. everybody. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so, Thank you so, so much. much. We actually have a pet side. Yes.